silence of the prison cell is deafening. She sits on the hard bench, waiting, knowing what's coming, just not when. It's the not knowing that's the most difficult. She wonders if he'll make it in time, if she'll be able to see him before they come for her. It was for him, after all. All of this was for him. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to episode 125, The Murder of Ria Volmorans. This episode is sponsored by Just Wellness. Is it just me, or is it like we're in an argument with winter? And just when you think it's over, it pops its head around the corner and says, oh, and one more thing. Yes, I know, it's only August, but that summer solstice thing happened, and I feel like that means we should be warming up, not experiencing snow. I guess... The lesson in this is don't let your guard down, because you never know what's around the corner. And this probably goes for our health too. Winter is flu season, but if we start slowing down on keeping up those defenses, there's a very good chance we'll end up with a nasty cold or flu just when we least expect it. Just Wellness's range of olive leaf tinctures is the perfect way to ensure you don't let your guard down and let a bug sneak in. With so many blends to choose from, ranging from aloe ferox, moringa and silitium to cancer bush and devil's claw, there really is something for every health concern you may have. Just take Just Wellness's tincture sublingually as directed each day and you'll soon start to reap the benefits. You can head over to their website and get free delivery when you order two of their products right now. Thank you to Just Wellness for their support of True Crime South Africa. Since 2019, True Crime South Africa has been telling the stories of the victims of violent crime in South Africa. The podcast is independent. That means no big or even little corporates fund it. And that's just the way I like it. And... It's the only independent podcast in South Africa that consistently charts in the top 10. Keeping a podcast like this going is time-consuming, and for the most part, it remains a one-woman process. It's me. I'm the one woman. You? Yes, you. Are the reason this podcast continues to flourish and help bring in tips on missing person and cold cases. If you'd like to help keep the show running, please consider supporting our sponsors, signing up to Patreon or PayPal, follow the show on the socials, as the kids say, and share it with your fellow partners in crime. You can find our social links and learn more about our sponsors at True Crime South Africa forward slash donate. Shout out to this week's Patreon and PayPal superstars. A huge thank you goes out to Romelia Draga, Ashley Wood, Manuela Bender, Vimpi Fanikak, Rihanna, Kayleen Beck, Marlene DeVette, Anastasia Mbili, Kolofelo Debequane, Margie, Rob Ruiz, Proudly South African, Brittany Kendall, Andi Swerpiri, Janine Berry, Monique Janssen van Feren, and Cloni Leoko for your support on Patreon, as well as Jeffrey Swanson and Ilka Zenskirali for your support on PayPal. Thank you so much, everyone. Patreon supporters get one additional exclusive episode a month, a shout-out on the pod, and other exclusive contents, including Q&As with me, as and when it's available. It's a minimum of $1 a month. I think you should do it. Please. And thank you. Keba. This week's episode is a little different than usual because although the people involved are all South African and part of the criminal acts took place in South Africa, the actual crime itself did not happen on South African soil. 
It did happen in one of our neighboring countries, though, in a community that was made up almost entirely of South African expats. So I figured it was close enough that I could cover it on True Crime South Africa. I've also had this case requested quite a few times, probably because it's a female perpetrator, definitely because it involves the death sentence, and maybe also because the deeper I dug into this case, the more rabbit holes I found. Sometimes I have to physically stop myself from rabbit holing to ensure you actually get an episode. There are just those cases where, regardless of how much time I spend on it, there always seems to be another Pandora's box to open. So, while I've done my best to cover as many of those as possible, there may be some I've missed, and you're welcome to share those with me, and maybe I can do a future update episode at some point. In researching this case, I used a ton of legal documents that had me a bit cross-eyed at one point, a chapter from Mickey Pistorius's book Fatal Females, and some media articles. I've based most facts on the legal documents, though, which I would hope would be the most factual. So, let's get into episode 125, The Murder of Rhea Vulmorans. The following episode may contain sensitive material, including descriptions of violence, sexual assault, or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. As is so often the case, I was able to find very little information about the victim in this case. While there was a wealth of information available about the perpetrator. Much of the information we know about Rhea Vulmerantz starts at the point at which she was already married and had three children with her husband Tini. She was born Maria Magdalena a traditional Afrikaans name which is often so common, even within one family, that the individual will shorten it to a variation that distinguishes them from other family members with the same names. She would call herself Rhea. Rhea was never a woman who was happy to be a stay-at-home mom, even after she and Tinny had their three children. She'd always kept her career in finance going, and did extremely well in any position she held. She was strong-minded, level-headed, and logical. In contrast, many would claim, to her husband, Tinny, who was less strong-minded and often submissive to his wife. Rhea also usually earned more than Tinny, who worked as a construction worker, something that, although not terribly unusual now, in the late 80s and early 90s was an uncommon dynamic within a heterosexual relationship, and one which would cause difficulties if the male partner felt emasculated in other ways. In 1990, Rhea and Tinny made a decision about their family's future that would change the course of many people's lives. They, like many others at that time, felt that crime levels in South Africa were becoming untenable, and they'd heard that there was a community of South African expats growing in the Botswana suburb of Pakalani, in that country's capital city, Khabarone. The Republic of Botswana is a landlocked country bordered by South Africa, Namibia and Zimbabwe. Botswana is one of the most sparsely populated countries in the world, with just 2.3 million residents in an area of 500,000 square kilometres, which puts it at about the same size as Madagascar and France. As is the case in many African countries, Botswana is a former British colony. It gained its independence from Britain in the 1960s, and at the time it was one of the poorest countries in the world. Since gaining its independence, it's managed to throw off the shackles of that difficult start and is now one of the fastest growing economies in the world and is considered an upper middle income country. This does have a lot to do with the country's mining sector though, on which it is heavily dependent and its unemployment rate is 20% compared to South Africa's 32%. 
At the time when the Volmerans family were considering moving to Botswana, the country was actively recruiting African diaspora to live within its borders and contribute to its economy with their skills, and in turn, offering a relatively low crime rate, good schooling, and a beautiful landscape in which to raise children. Of course, the expats, although welcomed for the most part by locals, would almost always still be seen as outsiders. Most of the people who took advantage of the move were white Afrikaans families, and it created within Cabrone, and specifically the suburb of Pakalane, a weird sort of mini South African bubble. After some inquiries, the couple realised that the move would be entirely possible. There were excellent primary and high schools that they could send their children to. The neighbourhood they'd be living in was primarily made up of South Africans, and Ria was soon able to secure a job with a company called Quena Rokla. The company still exists today and is a manufacturer of precast concrete. Ria, of course, would be in the finance department. Tini was able to secure a contract in construction, but both he and Ria understood that he would rarely be at home, as many of the projects he would be accepted to were many hours away from Pakalane. This, they agreed, was a small price to pay for what they perceived at the time as a better and safer childhood for their children. The Vormerances had no sooner settled into their rented home in Pakalane than another South African couple moved in just down the street from them. Justin and Mariette Borsch also had three children, although theirs were slightly younger than the Vormerans' children. Justin and Mariette had decided to move to Pakalani for many of the same reasons the Volmerans couple had. Mariette had not worked during her marriage to Justin. She'd grown up rather wealthy and privileged. Her father had owned several liquor stores in South Africa, and she'd never wanted for anything. And when she'd married Justin, it was understood that she would care for their children and keep the house, and she was never dissatisfied with this arrangement. She and Rhea were very different women in that respect, but they seemed to get along, and the Volmerans and Borsch families were soon firm friends. Justin and Tini were equally different. Justin was more like Rhea, strong-minded and logical, but they too seemed to get along well enough. Justin, like Tini, travelled quite a bit for work, so Mariette and Ria were often alone and supported one another. When Tini was home, though, it soon became clear that he and Ria's marriage was in trouble. Tini claimed that he felt overwhelmed by Ria's strong personality and couldn't deal with the way he often felt she dominated him in the relationship. Ria's side of the argument would only be revealed later. By 1993, he seemed to have found someone who made him feel far less emasculated, and he didn't need to go very far to find her. Tini Volmerantz and Mariette Borsch were having an affair right under their spouse's noses. Now, I will, to be fair, say that both parties claimed that they were not having an affair at this point, and that they were only very good friends. But there were many, many people who had knowledge of the dalliance, and they all put it down as having started around this time. Neither Rhea nor Justin, though, seemed to have any idea that their partners were cheating on them. Rhea and Tini's relationship was on and off, but they remained married. Their children were growing up, and the older two were moving out of the house and perhaps they wanted to try to keep their marriage together as long as possible, for the children's sake. In 1995, a sudden death shook the Pakalani South African expat community. Justin Bosch had been driving home from a work trip when he'd been involved in a car accident which had killed him. Mariette's family and friends were devastated for her and the children, and more than a little concerned that she wouldn't be able to cope without him. 
Mariette's inherited Justin's entire estate, but she'd never had to work with her own finances and didn't have a clue where to even start with ensuring bills were paid and the children's futures were secured. Rhea stepped in to provide her with some financial advice, and being completely unaware of the relationship between the woman and her own husband, asked Tinny to spend more time with Mariette and her children to provide some sort of stability and help with things around the house. Tinny, of course, happily agreed. And the more time he spent with Mariette, the more estranged he became from Rhea. Eventually, in 1996, although she still seemed to have no idea that her best friend and her husband were having an affair, Rhea filed for divorce. During this time, Rhea had been taking Mariette into her confidence, sharing the difficulties of her marriage with her, and Mariette had acted like any other good friend and sympathised with Rhea, and maybe even encouraged her to divorce Tinny. Some of Rhea's reasons for wanting to divorce her husband would come up later. Too late, voiced by some of her family members who'd been told things during this time. But there would be no way to verify it then, and we'll get into that a bit later in the episode. In June 1996, Tini was working away from home in Maun, which is six hours' drive from Khabarone. He and Ria's divorce was not yet final, but they were close to reaching an agreement, it seemed. Ria's mind, he would later claim, had been elsewhere during this period. Tini claimed that his wife had discovered some financial improprieties that it seemed her boss was responsible for, and Tini claimed that Ria was preparing for an auditor's visit in the second last week of June, during which she would ask them to see if they could identify what she'd seen. Ria's boss, a man called Henny Kutsia, was also part of the South African expat community. He and his wife had moved to Botswana together, but they'd since divorced. Henny would occasionally visit Ria at her home, and as such had met Mariette too. The nature of any friendship or other relationship between Henny and Mariette would never be deeply explained, at least not anywhere that I can find, but it would be proven that Henny had visited Mariette at her home on a few occasions. At one such occasion, which would become very important, occurred on the evening of the 24th of June 1996. Henny visited Mariette with a bottle of wine and a box of chocolates, and spent a few hours at her house. The very next day, Mariette Borsch left Botswana for South Africa. Unannounced, she arrived at the home of Dennis Weber. Dennis had been Justin's best friend, and he'd been keeping a few firearms that had belonged to Justin after his death, with the intention of purchasing them from Mariette at some point. Mariette hadn't wanted them after Justin had died. She'd never fired a weapon, she said, and had no intention of doing so. So when she arrived on Dennis Weber's doorstep and asked him for her late husband's 9mm Browning pistol, he was taken aback. Dennis said that Marietta told him she wanted to purchase a 9mm in Botswana, so she wanted to take that one back home to practice with it, so she could get her license in that country. This made no sense to Dennis, and he became even more confused when she told him she only needed to take four bullets with her. He insisted that this would never be enough for her to practice with, and convinced her to take 25 bullets instead. The biggest concern for Weber, though, was that Mariette would be taking the gun back into Botswana illegally. Mariette promised him, though, that she would hand the gun over at the border post and leave it there until she had the correct paperwork to be able to take it in. She left Dennis's house, leaving him wholly confused and more than a little concerned. And her next stop would be her brother-in-law's house. Mike Bosch and his wife Judith were just as surprised to see Mariette at their door as Dennis had been, and even more so 
when she produced Justin's gun and asked Mike to show her how to use it. Mike had also tried to convince Mariette that it wasn't a good idea to take the gun across the border illegally, and she'd given him the same story she gave Dennis. She'd hand it over at the border post and collect it later. Mariette had seemed in quite a rush, and eventually became exasperated with Mike's stalling and blurted out, What do you think I'm going to do? Shoot someone with it or something? Mike would eventually show Mariette how to load the gun and the basics of handling it. There was nowhere safe nearby for them to fire it, so they hadn't done that, but Mariette said she'd be fine. Mariette's final surprise stop that day was at her mother's house. She told her mom that she wanted her to come and visit with her in Botswana for a while. Her mom was a little taken aback, but agreed. She hadn't seen her grandchildren in a while, so she'd be happy to spend some time with them and her daughter, who she'd been very concerned about since Justin's death. So the woman packed a bag and got into Mariette's car as they headed back to Botswana in the early hours of, of the 26th of June. Although Mariette had promised Dennis and Mike that she would not smuggle the gun over the border illegally, as she neared the border between South Africa and Botswana, that is exactly what she did. She would later admit to having done this, although the reason she claimed would be in question. Mariette and her mother arrived at Mariette's home in the late afternoon, and Mariette summoned her second oldest daughter and gave her some cash, telling her to take Ria's teenage daughter out to dinner with her and her boyfriend that night. Her daughter was surprised, as she wasn't really very good friends with the girl, but wasn't going to miss out on a free dinner, so she readily agreed. What Mariette did next would be a matter that would be disputed by various accounts, but there is no doubt that her middle daughter and that girl's boyfriend had left the house and collected Ria's teenage daughter that night at about 8pm. Ria's teenage daughter was the last of her children living at home at that time. She would kissed her mother goodbye and told her she wouldn't be home too late. When the girl did return home at 11pm though, a scene of horror was waiting for her. In the kitchen, she found her mother, Ria Vulmerantz, lying in a pool of blood. The contents of a tea tray lay scattered around her, and she was face down. The terrified girl didn't know the number to call for local police, so she started phoning neighbours, including Mariette Bosch, her mother's best friend. One of the neighbours called police, and soon the Vulmerantz home was a crime scene. When Botswana and police arrived in the quiet suburb, they were surprised at the scene before them. Break-ins did happen in the area, but they hardly ever turned violent. And here, they would discover, was a resident who had sustained two gunshots and died from her injuries. The first thing police noticed was that there was no sign of a break-in. It appeared that Rhea had opened the door to her attacker or attackers. An autopsy would later show that the woman had been shot from behind. Her killer had been following her when they'd shot her. More confusing was the tea tray that lay scattered about the kitchen. It appeared to have been prepared for guests to drink tea. The teapot was filled and three cups lay smashed about the floor. Mariette Borsch received the call about Ria's death just after 11pm that night and was one of the first people on the scene. Some neighbours would say that she told them when they arrived that Rhea had had a heart attack. Tini was given the news of his wife's murder by telephone, and he said he would immediately hit the road for the six-hour drive back to Gaborone. As police worked the scene, Mariette gathered up Rhea's teenage daughter and the domestic worker that lived at the premises and took them back to her house. As part of the investigation, police interviewed the two direct neighbours to the Volmorant's home. One would provide an important piece of information. 
Janet Squire lived in the house next door to the Volmerans family. She told police that her husband had gotten home from work at around 8 p.m. and she'd gone downstairs to the kitchen to make him something to eat. While she was doing this, at about 8.45 p.m., she'd heard two loud noises and a woman's scream coming from the Volmerans' home. She said the noises had sounded like gunshots, but she was unsure at the time. She'd gone to the second level of her home where she'd had a clear view of the Volmerans' property and watched for a while, listening for any other sounds, but she'd heard nothing and decided it couldn't have been anything important and didn't take any further action. Rhea Volmerans had been dead for some time when her daughter found her, police knew, and so it was very likely that the two sounds Janet had heard were indeed the two gunshots that had killed the woman, and her time of death could be put at 8.45pm. Rhea's teenage daughter had little more to offer police than what she'd discovered when she arrived home at 11pm. She said that when she'd left the house for dinner, her mother had been alive and well and hadn't mentioned expecting any visitors. Tinny Vormerans arrived home the next morning. He went straight to the Bosch house to be reunited with his youngest daughter and would stay there for the foreseeable future. None of the Volmerans family would ever return to live in the home in which Rhea had been killed. As news of the murder spread, Rhea's family in South Africa were devastated. It seemed a horrific irony that the family had moved to Botswana for a safer future, only to have crime visited at their own front door in such a way. At the outset, The story that was delivered with the horrible news was that it looked like a home invasion gone wrong. Where that story came from is unknown. Some articles do claim that police initially thought an intruder had killed Rhea too, but I can't see this being the case from the evidence on the scene, so someone else must have been driving that story. It's very difficult to know exactly what actions were taken by police during this time. It does seem clear that Tinney was not contacted by police initially, nor was he asked to provide a statement until quite a bit later. Perhaps this came down to him having been so far from home on the night, but in my mind at least, he would have been an important person to interview right away, as he may have known who would have motive to kill his wife. Either way, Rhea Volmerans' body would be returned to the family within days of her autopsy, and Tinny and Mariette made plans to transport her body back to South Africa for burial. The Volmerans and Bosch families travelled together to South Africa to lay Rhea to rest. Tinny, Mariette and Tinny's teenage daughter would sleep over at Rhea's mother's house for the time that they were in the country. Rhea's mother, deeply grieving for her daughter, prepared guest rooms for Mariette and her granddaughter, and Tinny said he was happy to sleep on the couch. The woman was horrified, though, when she woke up on the morning of her daughter's funeral to find Mariette and Tinny sleeping in the same bed. On confronting her son-in-law, he claimed he'd been very upset during the night and had gone into Mariette's room to talk and he'd fallen asleep next to her. It was all very innocent, he said, but Rhea's mother would later say she couldn't shake the scene from her memory. Rhea Volmerans was laid to rest in the country of her birth at a ceremony attended by those who'd loved her, and all hoped that there would be a quick resolution to the investigation, and the guilty party would be arrested. Soon after they returned to Botswana, Tini and Mariette moved into a new rented home together. The Volmerans' lease had expired, and Tini had not renewed it. And then the Borsche's lease also expired, so the pair took up in a new home, together. They would continue to claim to anyone who asked that they'd only found solace in one another's arms and started a relationship after Rhea's death but there seems to have been far too much evidence to the contrary for this to have been the truth. <laughs>
When Tini Vormerantz was finally called in to give an official statement about his wife's murder, the contents of the statement looked as though it may move the investigation forward. Tini claimed that he knew exactly who had killed his wife. He believed that her boss, Henny Kutsia, had been the culprit. Tini claimed that on the day of her murder, his wife had phoned him and told him that she had strong evidence that Kutsia was committing fraud and that she was going to out him the next day when their auditors came for a meeting. Tini said that police could confirm this with his teenage daughter, as Rhea had told this to her as well. The girl would later say that her mother had mentioned something about this, but she hadn't paid too much attention and couldn't provide detail. Tini told police that he believed Kutsia had murdered Rhea to stop her from revealing his fraudulent activities. Police were immediately interested in this lead, although surprised that the grieving widower hadn't brought it to their attention earlier. Henny Kutsia was brought in for questioning. He adamantly denied he had any involvement in Rhea's murder and told police he had an alibi. He'd been at a braai on the night of the murder until 11pm, so there was no way he could have been at Rhea's house, and he said there were multiple witnesses present at the braai who could attest to this. He also denied ever committing financial fraud at work, and said that his auditors had eventually done their audit in the days after Rhea's murder, and they'd found no improprieties. Police would later confirm this with the auditing firm and also had their own financial team look over the books and said they couldn't find any proof that Henny was doing anything wrong financially. The autopsy had shown that Rhea Vormerantz had been shot with a 9mm handgun. Two bullets had been retrieved and kept as evidence. Henny Kutsia did have several firearms licensed to him. He was a recreational hunter and one of the guns he owned was, indeed, a 9mm. He handed it over to police for ballistic testing, and the results came back as negative. Rhea had not been killed with Henny's licensed firearm. With this lead taking police no further in their investigation, the case slowly started to come to a standstill. There were, of course, still rumours hitting police's ears about an affair between Mariette and Tini, but the couple had denied it when asked, and Tini had claimed that he and his wife had been very much in love, and he and Mariette had only gotten together afterwards because they were so deep in grief and needed comfort from one another. Other than these rumours, though, police had no proof that either party had anything to do with Rhea's murder at this point. I will point out, though, that it would later be revealed that police did not properly follow up Tini's alibi. This information came up in an appeal document that was drafted by a legal representative, so I can only attest to its accuracy as far as I would hope that a legal document would be accurate. The document states that Tini had claimed he was in Maun for work on the night Rhea was killed. He was alleged to have planned to drive back that night, but had been held up because he had to pay his workers. He told police that this could be checked with his foreman, but it never was, according to this document. Further, the document claims that Tinney did not arrive back in his vehicle on the morning after Rhea's murder, but rather that he'd been collected from the airport by one of his daughters. The flight time from Maun to Gaborone is just one and a half hours. And this, of course, was in a time where you were not required to produce identification when flying and tickets could be booked on a whim at ticket counters at the airport by paying cash. It's also unknown as to whether police checked phone records to ensure that the phone call Tinney said Rhea made to him that day was actually made. Now, please don't understand this as my insinuation of anything as relates to Tini Vormerantz, but these were some interesting assertions which were made in legal documents I found related to this case. In September 1996, Mariette and Tini once again travelled to South Africa. They visited Mariette's brother-in-law, Mike Bosch, 
and she pulled him aside during their visit and handed him back the gun he'd last seen in her possession in June when she'd shown up asking him to give her instructions on how to use it. He was concerned that she'd clearly, once again, brought the gun back over the border illegally, but she seemed so shaken and begged him to take it and get rid of it for her that he hadn't questioned her. Both Mike and his wife were surprised to hear that one of the reasons for Marriott's trip to South Africa this time was to visit a wedding dress designer. She and Tinny were getting married, she said. It had been just over a year since Justin had died, and less than three months since Rhea had died, and Mike wondered if it was a bit soon for the pair to be marrying, but he kept his thoughts to himself at the time. After Tinny and Mariette had left their home, though, Judith and Mike Borsch started to discuss all the strange things that had happened around their sister-in-law in the past few months. Mike told his wife about Mariette giving the gun to him, and soon they both realised that the Browning was the same calibre weapon that had been used to kill Rhea Vulmerantz. Although horrified that Mariette may have had something to do with the woman's death, the couple were also not prepared to be saddled with a possible murder weapon that had also illegally been smuggled over the border several times, so they contacted the South African Police Service. They explained the story to the police in South Africa and confirmed that they believed that, at minimum, Mariette was guilty of illegally taking the gun into both Botswana and South Africa. Then they went home, leaving the gun that had caused them so many headaches with the police and hoping beyond hope that their sister-in-law was not about to get into the deepest trouble of her life. The SAPS contacted Botswana and police shortly after they received the gun and the accompanying story. Arrangements were made to send the weapon to police in Botswana so that they could carry out ballistic testing on it. But in the meantime, with the official statements from Mike and Judith Bosch in hand, in October 1996, they put out an arrest warrant for Mariette Bosch on the charge of illegally bringing an unlicensed firearm into Botswana. While Mariette was being held in the cells at the police station, Tinny paid her a visit. Officers overheard him telling her to keep quiet and not say anything, and he was arrested on the spot for interfering in an investigation and was held for a few hours before being released. It would only be a few days until the ballistic results came back on the weapon Mariette had smuggled across the border. Bullets test fired from it were a perfect match to those found in Rhea Volmerantz's body. Mariette Bosch was charged with the woman's murder. In the days after Mariette's arrest, Tinny made contact with several journalists. He held press conferences during which he said that Mariette was being falsely accused and he knew who had killed Rhea and it wasn't Mariette. He continued to accuse Henny Kutsia of Rhea's murder, despite the man having been cleared by police. Tinny arranged for a lawyer to represent Mariette, and it would later become clear, again according to legal documents I read, that this lawyer was taking instruction directly from Tinny, and not Mariette, as on several occasions, the lawyer seemed surprised when his client made certain statements he'd clearly not been aware of. Tinny also hired a hypnotist and a psychic to visit Mariette in jail, and the version she gave police about her involvement in the gun smuggling soon proved as bizarre as these visitors. Mariette Bosch denied having killed Rhea Volmerantz. She did admit to having smuggled the gun across the border illegally, but said she'd done so under coercion. Her version was that when Henny Kutsia had visited her on the evening of the 24th of June, he had drugged her, and then, while she was sedated, he had hypnotized her and convinced her to go to South Africa and collect her late husband's Browning handgun so that he could purchase it from her. She claimed that Henny had also threatened her while she was under hypnosis 
so that once she awoke from the state, she felt compelled to do as he'd asked. She claimed that she'd not felt like herself during that trip to South Africa and had suffered from a constant blinding headache, which she believed was as a result of the sedative Henny had allegedly administered to her and the hypnosis. Mariette claimed that she'd had no idea why Henny wanted the gun, but she'd collected it and brought it back to Botswana. She claimed she'd arrived in Botswana on the afternoon of the 26th, dropped her mom off at her house, and then driven straight to Henny's office to deliver the gun to him. She said he hadn't been at his desk, so she'd left it and the ammunition on his desk, and she was sure that one of his employees had seen her there. This man would never be located. She then claimed she'd gone to her daughter's school for a meeting, but realised she'd gotten the date wrong and then went back home. She claimed she'd arrived home at 7.35pm and had not left the house again. Police, though, did not believe this. And in fact, they had witness testimony that refuted it. The Borsche's live-in domestic worker, Anakin Twagai, said that Mariette had arrived home at 3pm that afternoon with her mother, but that she'd not left the house again until 8pm, after her daughter had left to go to dinner. Aniki said that Mariette had only reappeared around 11pm, when the phone call came in to say that Ria Volmerantz had been murdered. The young woman who'd worked for the Bosch family since 1995 told police that she'd been very happy working for the Borsches and didn't want to get Mariette into trouble, but she'd realised something was very wrong when, the day after Ria's murder, Tini Volmerantz had approached her and told her that if police asked her, she should say that Mariette hadn't left the house the entire night. Aniki had also confirmed that she'd been aware of a relationship between Tini and Mariette before Ria had been killed. While Aniki would become one of the prosecution's star witnesses, Mariette's two daughters would stand for the defence and claim that their mother had not left the house again after 7.30pm. Her middle daughter, who'd gone to dinner, said that she'd locked the house when she'd left and didn't believe that her mother would have been able to get out of the house while she was gone. The police and the prosecution team were hesitant to accept these statements from the girls because they felt that the two were firstly relatively young and also they had a significant interest in their mother not being jailed as they'd already lost their father. Mariette would remain in prison for almost a year until she was finally granted bail in September 1997 while she waited for her trial to begin. Within days of her release, Tinny and Mariette were married. It would later be alleged that the couple had purposefully done this to avoid being forced to give evidence against one another as spouses were not required to testify in a court of law. Around this time, Tinny's oldest daughter also got married, and Mariette requested permission to travel to South Africa with Tinny to attend the wedding. I'm quite surprised that Botswana authorities agreed to this, but they would almost find themselves sorry that they did. When Mariette was in South Africa, she consulted with a few lawyer friends, and all of them advised Mariette not to return to Botswana. They told her that South Africa would not repatriate her to a country where she'd be facing the death penalty if found guilty, so it would be in her best interest to stay in South Africa. Mariette seriously considered this for a while, but Tinny convinced her that it was best to go back and face the trial, because he had no doubt she was going to be found not guilty. Now this brings in for the first time one of the most important legal parts of this case, and that is that Botswana still has the death penalty in place for premeditated murder. The death penalty is still in place in 30 African countries, including Botswana. In many of those countries there have been no executions for many decades, but Botswana continues to execute at least one prisoner per year. 
In most cases, the prisoner is executed many years after being put on death row, as there are appeal processes that must be allowed. And in some cases, the president can pass clemency on a death row prisoner. This is quite important. So keep it in mind, and I'll remind you of that later. Mariette chose to return to Botswana. She was taken back into custody when she arrived in the country, and I'm not sure why this happened. Botswanan law is, of course, slightly different from South African law, so perhaps they were able to revoke her bail for some reason. Either way, Mariette was back in prison, waiting for her trial to start, and Tini was at home with their respective daughters. In Mickey Pistorius' book, Fatal Females, she says that there were rumours doing the rounds at this time that Tini had started a relationship with his minor stepdaughter, Mariette's youngest daughter. At the time, this girl would have been about 15 or 16. So I use the word relationship very loosely here, because Tini was almost three times her age, was in a role as her father, and had been for at least two years. And the girl had actually taken his surname when he married her mother. So if these rumours had any form of substance to them, the very thought is quite sickening to me. Mariette heard none of these rumours, though. The Botswana prison system works quite differently from South Africa, and there were very few people who were allowed to visit her, Also, anyone that appeared on the prosecution's witness list would be out of bounds to her in the run-up to the trial, so she was essentially cut off from the world. Tini did continue to visit his wife, though, and funded her lawyer. He was adamant that she would be found not guilty. When Mariette's trial started, the prosecution presented several witnesses, firstly around her procurement of the gun. Dennis Weber and his wife testified about Mariette's coming to take the gun from him the day before Rhea Vulmerantz was shot, and Mike and Judith Borsch testified to her interactions with them that had led to her first being in possession of the weapon and then them eventually handing it over to the SAPS. The prosecution knew that Mariette was going to be presenting a defence that she'd collected the gun on behalf of Henny Kutsia and that she'd been in some sort of hypnotic state, and also in deep fear of him when she'd done so. As such, they asked these four witnesses to go into great detail about Mariette's behaviour when she'd collected the gun. All four said independently that she did not seem any different from her normal manner. She hadn't complained of any headache, and she did not seem to be afraid of anything in particular. The only time Mike Borsch said she did look concerned was when she'd returned the gun to him and asked him to hide it or sell it off for her. The defence attempted to paint Judith Borsch as someone who had purposefully tried to get Mariette in trouble because she'd never liked the woman. Judith admitted that she and Mariette had never been the best of friends and that she hadn't felt like Mariette was a very good wife to Justin but it had actually been a very difficult decision for her to agree to hand the gun over to the SAPS because she knew that Justin and Mariette's children would suffer as a result. When Anakin Twagai took the stand to testify about Mariette's whereabouts on the night of the murder, she confirmed her statement about Tini Vulmerans having asked her to lie about that night, and then... She revealed that in the months before the trial, she had once again been approached by Vormerantz, and he'd threatened to kill her if she testified against Mariette in court. The defence attempted to claim that Anneke had a grudge against Mariette, but the truth was that with her former employer in prison, she'd actually ended up losing her job over the whole matter, so she'd certainly had no reason to make up stories, if, indeed, Mariette had been home that night. Sadly, and rather disturbingly, in the months after she delivered her testimony in court, Aniki Ntwagai passed away under what are described as mysterious circumstances. Her death 
has never been ruled as foul play. Although the prosecution was not required to prove a motive for the murder, through their witnesses, it became clear that they believed Mariette's motive was very simply teeny. She hadn't wanted to wait for him to divorce his wife, they claimed, and perhaps she also wanted him to come into their marriage with all the assets he would have if Rhea was no longer alive and not have to split them in a divorce. One of the prosecution's most important witnesses would be someone who'd been a talking point for some time, and the manner in which he appeared on the stand would only serve to increase the talk. Henny Kutsia appeared before the court on the basis of an agreement that he'd made with the state that he would be given immunity from prosecution for any criminal offences he may incriminate himself in when he testified. The defence objected to his appearing under this agreement because they hadn't been informed of it in writing, but the judge allowed the testimony to continue. The nature of the crimes he may incriminate himself in, or what he was given immunity from prosecution for, was never clarified, and this only strengthened the suspicions that either he'd been involved in some type of fraud, or he'd had some hand in Rhea's murder. But when he began to testify, this seemed to not quite be it. It was once again confirmed through his testimony that his auditors had found no fraudulent activities in the company's books. Kutsia admitted that he had visited Mariette on the 24th on what he claimed was her invitation, and he'd brought chocolates as a gift, and they drank wine together. He denied drugging or hypnotizing the woman and claimed he'd never threatened her. To that point, Kutsia said, he most definitely had not asked Mariette to collect her late husband's gun from South Africa. He said he was well aware of the law around firearms in Botswana, and in any case, he would have no use for another 9mm handgun, as he owned his own, which the police had tested against the bullets and found not to be the murder weapon. Kutsia further testified that Rhea had never accused him of any wrongdoing, and he was not aware of any allegations she planned to make against him. By the time the prosecution rested its case, they'd managed to paint a pretty damning picture as far as Mariette's guilt was concerned. The defence, though, still had a few aces up their sleeves. Although Mariette's defence was essentially that she did not commit the murder, her defence lawyer also saw fit to present an alternative suspect to the court. Penny Kutsia, and the bulk of their witnesses would contribute solely to pointing the finger at that man. First came three witnesses who'd attended the bra that Kutsia was at on the night of Rhea's murder. This, of course, was his alibi, and he claimed he'd left the bra around 11pm. The three witnesses would say differently. Each testified that they believed Kutsia had left the bra between 8 and 8.30pm. They said the bride had started around 6 p.m. and the food had been ready by 8 p.m. and Kutsia had left directly after eating. Under cross-examination, all three admitted that they had been consuming alcohol and they had not been watching the clock, but they'd estimated the time by when they believed they'd eaten. The credibility of at least one of these witnesses would be called into question, though, when it was revealed that the young man had been dismissed by Kutsia a few days after the bra over an unrelated incident. The prosecutor alleged that he'd come to testify in court in revenge against Kutsia, and that perhaps he'd even convinced the other two witnesses that his recollection of the time Kutsia left was correct. Another witness presented by the defence was Henny Kutsia's ex-wife. The woman testified that her marriage to Kutsia had been tumultuous and that he'd been violent on occasion and even threatened her life when she'd refused to hand over a document he'd wanted. In addition, she claimed that the day after Rhea's murder, her ex-husband had contacted her and said that she needed to be more security conscious because he'd driven past her home the night before, around 10pm, 
and noticed that she didn't have her outside light on. The prosecution attempted to discredit the woman's evidence by saying that she was still bitter toward her ex-husband as he'd been the one to initiate their divorce and she'd not gotten what she wanted financially out of the end of their marriage. They also asked the woman, although it was clearly impossible for her to answer the question, if her ex-husband had indeed left the bride at 30pm and killed Rhea Volmerans at 8.45pm, why would he still be driving around Pakalani at 10pm and then still tell her he'd done so? The atmosphere in the court would later be described as a bit of a circus. The trial was a headline grabber and many members of the public packed the gallery to get a view of the woman who'd been nicknamed the White Mischief of Botswana. The nickname was a reference to a book published in the 80s by a British journalist about the murder of a white woman called Jocelyn Hay in Kenya in the midst of a very similar bubble-like community of expats. Mariette's daughters both attended the trial and her youngest daughter was often in tears at the ridiculous behaviour of some of the participants. The judge's behaviour was also called into question on occasion when he made some strange remarks, including asking a witness to pretend she was married to him. One almost offhand remark he made would later become the source of an appeal by Mariette when the judge essentially claimed that the onus lay on the defence, to prove she did not commit the murder, when, of course, that is legally not correct. The witness who the judge had suggested should pretend she was married to him was also a source of curiosity in the courtroom. Dr. Louise Ulefia was a registered clinical psychologist, but she was also a sex advice columnist for a South African magazine, and her notoriety for that role seemed to diminish her credibility, at least in the public's view, in the courtroom, as they appeared to be solely focused on her hot pink suit and permed blonde hair, rather than her testimony. Her evidence was regarding Mariette's possible capacity to commit such a crime. Willefia had assessed Mariette and told the court that the woman had a low IQ, and she did not believe that she had the mental capacity to plan and execute a crime of this nature without assistance. She also said it was entirely possible that Mariette's story of feeling hypnotised by Kutsia and his fear-mongering tactics was true, as according to her, the woman's deeply impressionable character meant that she would be easily coerced, and she may have become so fearful that she disassociated. The prosecution would hit back at this, saying that none of the witnesses who'd come into contact with her while she was on the gun collection trip in South Africa had said she'd behaved strangely at all. I think it is important to state that in Dr. Mickey Pistorius' book, Fatal Females, she says that she agrees with Dr. Urlefia's assessment that Mariette would not have had the capacity to commit the murder and plan it out on her own. After attempting to put forward as much doubt as they possibly could in Mariette's guilt, the defence rested, and the judge retired to consider his verdict. Everyone was very much aware that if the judge found that Mariette was guilty, and that there were no extenuating circumstances in the murder, she could be facing the death penalty. If Mariette had ever wished for one minute that she just stayed behind in South Africa when she'd been told to by those lawyers, she didn't seem to show it. That was right up until the moment when the judge proclaimed her guilty and found that there were no extenuating circumstances to his mind. He said that what Mariette had done had been, quote, wicked and born out of jealousy and lust, end quote. He did not accept Dr. Ulefia's evidence that Mariette could not have had the capacity to commit the murder and instead decided that it was clear she had acted alone. In February 2000, he sentenced Mariette Bosch Volmerans to death by hanging. Mariette would have had the opportunity to appeal and if that appeal failed, to seek clemency from the President of Botswana. Botswana. 
Tini once again took to the press to proclaim that his wife was the victim of illegal railroading and that the real killer walked free. After her sentencing, Mariette ended her arrangement with her first lawyer and took on new counsel for her appeal. It would later emerge that the defence lawyer had begged Tini to make a statement claiming that he may have unintentionally influenced Mariette into killing his wife. This statement would likely have saved Mariette's life, but whether he felt that this would simply be disingenuous or he just didn't want to, Tini never agreed to do so. I must say that I do find it interesting that the lawyer would make this suggestion. Surely he would not be asking Tinny to lie, so could it be possible that he'd come into some information, perhaps from his now utterly desperate client, that it made him think that this would be a fair request? Either way, such a statement was not included in Mariette's appeal. Instead, her attorney focused on the judge's interpretation of the law and evidence in the case, insisting that the judge had not followed the letter of the law and had entertained what was referred to as misdirections, which could have skewed the verdict. Three Commonwealth judges would review Mariette's case in its entirety. Two found that the judge had indeed entertained misdirections of elements of the law in the trial, but in their judgments of the evidence before them, not one of the three believed that they would have reached a different, ultimate decision as to her guilt. In their summaries, the judges did say that they believed certain evidence could have been presented to show extenuating circumstances, but the defence had failed to do so, and as such, the judge could only go with what he'd been presented. Mariette's appeal was unsuccessful, and she remained on death row. While the appeal had been running, her lawyer had been simultaneously putting together a plea for clemency from the president of Botswana. Tini, too, had been trying various ways to get Mariette off death row. He'd appealed to the president of South Africa at the time, Thabo Mbeki, to make a request to Botswana to spare Mariette's life. Mbeki said he would consider it. The president of Botswana, however, did not respond to the plea for clemency immediately. It would later be pointed out that a response to a clemency plea is not a right for offenders, and the president can choose to whom he responds and how he does so. On Friday the 30th of March, Tini, his stepdaughter and daughter, drove through to the prison for their usual visit with Mariette. On arrival, they were informed that the prison authorities were conducting surprise inspections of cells and they were not allowed to see Mariette that day. They left disappointed, but hopeful that they'd be able to see her the next day. The next morning, they all piled into the car and started the drive out to the prison. Halfway, while listening to the radio, a breaking news segment came through. And this was how they learned that at 5.30am that morning, Mariette had been hanged. It would later emerge that Mariette had been informed of her imminent execution 24 hours before it happened. She was read her death notice on Friday the 30th, but unlike in some countries where death row prisoners are allowed to have a last visit with their family, a last meal, and often even given a sedative before they are hanged, Mariette was informed that she would be entitled to none of that under Botswana law. Her family would not be informed that she was going to be executed and her last meal would be standard prison fare. Mariette's family were horrified that she'd been executed so suddenly. Her lawyer told the media that other death row inmates in Botswana had waited years for their execution after their failed appeals and they hadn't even been given the courtesy of a reply on the clemency request from the president. Botswana authorities responded to say that under law in their country, they were under no obligation to inform the prisoner's family of their scheduled execution. They also claimed that the president had informed them verbally the week before 
that he would not be granting clemency and they were also under no obligation to transfer that news to the prisoner or her attorney. In a sadly ironic twist, President Thabo Mbeki announced that Monday, the 2nd of April, that he would be making a plea for clemency to the President of Botswana himself. He was quickly informed that his efforts were too late. In accordance with Botswanan law, Mariette's body was not handed back to her family for burial. She was buried in an unmarked grave somewhere in the prison cemetery. A Botswanan humanitarian organization would demand an inquiry into Mariette Bosch Volmerans' execution. When the review was finally made, it was determined that while the government could have handled the matter more delicately, essentially none of Mariette's rights were violated and no laws were broken. That, as far as they were concerned, was the end of that. For Mariette's family and friends, though, their devastation was far from over. And some members of Ria's family, too, felt like justice was not necessarily done for her either. Many could not help but wonder whether Mariette really had acted alone. It was revealed that when Mariette was initially arrested, she was given the opportunity to turn state witness, and she declined. When family members asked why she'd done so, she allegedly said only, I can't do that. He's been too good to me. Further questions and pieces of information cast even more doubt on the situation. It was revealed that the reason Rhea had gone to the lawyers in 1996 to file for divorce against Tinny was because she'd claimed he tried to kill her. She allegedly told her sister that she'd woken one night to Tinny attempting to smother her with a pillow. Her screams for help had brought one of her daughters into the room and Tinny had stopped. The prosecution had, of course, believed that Mariette had left the house that night with the gun and gone to Rhea's home where she'd pretended to be there to visit. Rhea had gone to the kitchen to prepare tea for them and when she'd started walking down the hallway with the tray, Mariette had shot her twice from behind. But witnesses on the scene had said that there had been three cups on the tray that night. So if this was the case... Who was the third cup for? Mariette deciding to pick up her mom on a seeming whim, in retrospect, seems to have all been part of the plan. Mariette knew what she was about to do and that things were going to get pretty hectic in her house. Having her mom there to help care for the teenagers in the fallout must have been helpful. It also emerged that Tinny's youngest daughter, had been instructed by her father to find the divorce papers in her mother's desk at home and destroy them before police searched the home. He allegedly didn't want police to know that their marriage was in serious trouble. The rumours about Tinny's alleged relationship with Mariette's young daughter persisted after her death, and according to Mickey Pistorius's book, they were spotted on a beach in South Africa a few months after she was executed, holding hands. Tinny would move to a rural part of Botswana where his children and Ria's youngest daughter apparently regularly visited him. It's very difficult to say whether or not Mariette Bosch really was the only perpetrator of Ria Volmerans's murder. Mickey Pistorius is a very experienced forensic psychologist, so her opinion that Mariette indeed lacked the capacity to execute the deed on her own must hold some weight. But that does not remove responsibility from her. In many states in America, regardless of whether you pulled the trigger, so to speak, or if you were only a party to a murder, you will also receive the death penalty. And whether or not we agree with the death penalty is a moot point. It is the law of the country that Mariette chose to live in and commit murder in. I must say that the human part of me cringed at how her execution was handled. <laughs>
not because she should have been given any preferential treatment. Again, Botswana is entitled to its own laws, but I do deeply feel for her family. They did not commit any crimes, and they, especially her and Rhea's children, had been through an absolutely horrendous time. I just cannot imagine how horrific it must have been for them to lose their mother like that. And yes, that counts for both Mariette and Rhea's deaths. I realise that I've spent an awfully long time speaking about Mariette Borsch, and the possibility exists that she was a victim of some kind here too, perhaps of manipulation and coercion, perhaps of blind loyalty. But we also have to be very logical and understand that she had been conducting an affair with Tini for many years, and she'd managed to hide that pretty darn well. So who knows? I will say, the motive espoused here bugs me. It doesn't make sense. Rhea wanted to divorce Tini, and it actually seemed like it was Tini that was holding things up on his end. Mariette wanted to be with Tini, and she had first-hand knowledge of Rhea's side of things because her best friend was confiding directly to her. So, why would she want to risk everything to kill Rhea? The only thing I can think of is money. Someone didn't want to split the Vulmerance's assets. But Mariette had her own assets she'd inherited from Justin's death. So, unless she was really that greedy, it doesn't make a ton of sense that she'd go that far. I don't know. With all the rumours, scandal and headlines aside, a deeply painful story remains. A story in which a woman, Rhea Volmerantz, was betrayed in the worst possible way by two people she trusted. Her husband, who'd carried on an affair behind her back with her best friend. And then that very so-called best friend who'd seen fit to take her life. She did absolutely nothing to deserve what was done to her. All she wanted to do was end her marriage and move on with her life. Instead, she lost it and the trauma that would be visited on so many people for so many generations to come as a result is simply incomprehensible. Rhea Vulmerans, rest gently. If you'd like to hear more victim-focused true crime content, please subscribe to True Crime South Africa on Spotify or the platform you're using to listen right now. If you're looking for something still related to real-life stories, but often with a more positive slant, you can check out my new podcast series, I Live Through This. You can follow both podcasts on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then. Thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon.